It's been quite the life for David. He's completely different at this end of the story than the young shepherd that we met at the very beginning. Except not completely different. But there have been a lot of years in between. It hasn't been just wolves that he's had to defend his sheep from. There was a Goliath as well, and Philistines. And then there was ducking spears thrown at him from Saul. There is the friendship of Jonathan that then he had to give up because of Saul's anger and jealousy. There was Michal, his first wife, who loved him and helped him to escape. There were all of those years in the caves and running for his life while Saul sought to destroy him. And then there was Abigail, too, his second wife, who came and rescued him just at the point where he didn't think he could handle one more thing going wrong in his life and was about to kill her husband and all of her household until Abigail came and gave him the food that his troops rightfully deserved that her husband should have given him and all was set right again. And then there were still more Philistines, even in the midst of all of this. And in the midst of one of those battles, right, Saul did finally die, but along with Jonathan as well. And David cried out in pain and in missing Jonathan and ordered mourning for both him and for Saul. And yet even with Saul gone, he still wasn't made king. There were still negotiations to be had between the tribes of Israel and the tribes of Judah. There was still a lot of diplomacy and a lot of negotiations and a lot of work. But finally, finally was that day where not only he was made king by all the kingdoms, but he recaptured the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines and brought it in to a new city, Jerusalem, that he had built, a center of a unified kingdom now, now with the symbol of God and all of the history of God leading them out of Egypt present in that moment. And David danced. Can you feel the relief and all of the work and having that moment? But then life kept going and turning and that moment became not enough. And we come to the really hard part of the story as if the other parts before weren't hard enough, where now David is not only now the one sinned against, but the one who is doing the sinning and doing the taking as he takes Bathsheba, as his son takes his half-sister, as David does nothing and the family falls apart as Mark preached on last week. This whole story goes between the personal and the social every turn of the way. We talked about the personal confession between David and Nathan around Bathsheba, and then Bill came in and talked about how that went beyond David personally and into his family. And we talked about the repentance of David personally but then the repentance that was needed within his family and within his kingdom as his son who has rebelled against him is died, is killed, dies. And David can't pull his personal grief together to be king for a nation with soldiers who are slinking back into Jerusalem who defended him and died for him, but he is so bereft over losing his son, he can't be there for his soldiers. It's the play of father and king. It's the play of our personal relationship with God and its social ramifications. It's the both end of all of it. And today we come to a part of the story, honestly, we leave off a lot. We all know about David and Goliath, but as we go deeper and deeper into the story, we become less and less familiar. Because it does get more and more complicated. It's not easy to tell, and it's not the fun Sunday school stories that we're all used to. But we do ourselves a huge disservice 
because we leave off the part of the story where we see everything that David has been through and how he remains steadfast to God's promise, even and especially when there's no dramatic revelation from God. There's no earth-shattering epiphany or connection or moment. This is David in the grit of faith, holding on to this promise despite all that has happened to him, despite all that he has done to others, and making a way forward. His return into Jerusalem as king once again, uniting the kingdoms once again, is an incredible witness and testimony to the, what Paul talked about in terms of how suffering can be turned into endurance, endurance into character, and character into the hope that does not disappoint. And we see David as an incredibly gracious king once more. As he's going back into Jerusalem, as he's going back to be king once again and to work to reunite once again, we've shared one story here of four that happen in these chapters of how he responds. There's Shimei who cursed him, right, and took sides with Absalom who's coming back. And typical, you know, right, what we would expect in a typical reaction to this is to have Shimei put to death now that David is returning and Absalom is no more. But David spares Shimei and grants him life. There will be no more death on this day. He also does a thing that we easily skip over because we don't know the people and aren't in the story deep enough to catch how significant it is that happens. He switches generals. So he removes his own general that's seen him through the time through hiding in caves, Joab, and puts Amasa in his place, in his vocation instead. Amas is the general that led the rebellion with Absalom. That's the same as President Lincoln after the Civil War, taking Ulysses S. Grant out of commission and putting in Robert E. Lee. Like, this is a really big deal that David is making and stepping into to make unification possible, to do what he can to lead a bridge across the chasm and to bring the country back together. And he doesn't stop there because one of his friends, not a part of the kingdom of Israel, comes Barzillai, and, and he, David offers him a place at his court, and Barzillai declines, wanting to stay in his own land in the Transjordan, but does then send his son in his stead. And on his deathbed, David will tell his son Solomon to guard with generosity Barzile's sons into the generations ahead, honoring their, their help and their commitment in that hard time. And then there's the story that we read today, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name Alexa, and you rocked it out. I'm just going to say Jonathan's son, Saul's grandson. And and this is one who should have come with David when he was retreating and fleeing and David was looking for him and he wasn't there. And, and Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son, a servant was there and the servant says that he had stayed behind to try to reclaim Saul's line and get power of his own in the midst of Absalom's rebellion. And so David strips all of the land from him that he had given to him as a promise to Jonathan and instead gives it to his servant, Ziba. Well, now David's returning, and Jonathan's son is there to greet him, looking a frightful mess because of his grieving practice of not caring for himself to show how distraught he was over David's plight and how concerned, and that he was still, in fact, in solidarity, and tells a whole different side of the story, that Ziba had actually betrayed him because he was lame and couldn't walk, so when he had ordered the servant to go get the donkey and the provisions to go out with David, Ziba actually abandoned him and then took everything that he was going to be given and told David that it was from him instead of from his master, from Jonathan's son. But David has a focus, and he knows what needs to be done, and he knows there isn't time to get into who is telling the truth here. 
And so in decisiveness and in gentleness, he asks for them to divide the land in half and to each share and to put to rest whatever had happened and to move forward in some way and fashion that would again bring about peace. And so David gets back to Jerusalem, and he's finally there, but now Sheba leads a revolt exploiting the same tensions between the northern tribes and the southern tribes that Absalom had exploited. And then David has to send Amasa out to pursue him, and the story goes on from there. Come to Bible study. We'll get into it in detail from there. But the point here is that the punches don't stop coming. David is dealing with round after round after round, and he's doing it like a boss. He is managing everything that comes at him, and he's still going on. He's keeping his focus. He knows his purpose, and that is the unification of all of Israel, and he is taking the suffering and he is taking the wisdom that he has earned from that. He is taking the endurance of grief. And he has built character. A character that can rest and trust in God's promises to establish his kingdom even when there has been bitter brokenness. Even when there is no new direct revelation from God. And if there's anything that I want from the church today, it's for that grit. It's to be able to say that focused with all of the waves that keep coming. To stay that committed even when we don't have any extra revelation to reassure us. To trust the promises that we have been given so much so that we can lead the way that God would have us leave, even when we don't hear a direct word of affirmation or correction from God. I want us to know the promises that God holds for us and to trust them so fully that we can make them the sole focus of our lives and do everything that we can to make them a reality for not just ourselves, but for an entire city, for an entire Jerusalem, for an entire country. May we be followers of Christ, the way that David followed God. I want to close with words from my professor um, of the Hebrew Bible who wrote the commentary um, for 2 Samuel here. He has a powerful way of summing things. This comes from uh, Dr. Bruce Birch, and he sums up these chapters and this part of David's story in this way. Chapters 19 through 20 are not resurrection moments in David's story. They are testimony to the realities of brokenness and violence that surround the exercise of human political power. But the promise has been voiced and is still certain. David is God's anointed king. He has been to the depths of personal despair in the death of Absalom and to the desperation of political failure in the loss of his kingdom. And he is trusted in the goodness of God's promise. We, like David, can trust God's promise. But we, like him, must do so in continued engagement with the complexities of our personal and social lives. We could do far worse than to face those complexities with compassion for those who have wronged us, Shimei, who cursed David, acceptance of ambiguities we cannot resolve, Ziba and Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, Appreciation for loyalties of friends and family, Barzillai. Decisiveness when difficult action must be taken to avoid further division, the rebellion of Sheba. And willingness to entertain wise alternatives, the wise woman of Abel. Come to Bible study for that story. Or, you know, read your Bible. These stories of the struggles and brokenness of David's later years do not contain dramatic religious experiences to reassure David of God's presence. 
In our own troubled world and in the troubled moments of our own lives, we too seldom receive dramatic religious experiences to reassure us. But like David, we are required to remember God's promises as they have been made known to us and to trust that God is in the midst of our decisions and relationships, enabling our most faithful responses to the events of our lives. May we be faithful whether it comes from doubt and nervousness or assurance and confidence, may we always seek that faithfulness that is based in the promises of our God who will go with us and who will never leave us. We're gonna sing a hymn about those promises, about that trust when we cannot yet see we trust that God does see and will guide us and work in us, through us, with us, and in spite of us to establish God's kingdom on earth. Amen. <laughs>